everyone. My name is Troy Lamel Stovall. I'm the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director for Maryland Tedco, Maryland's engine for innovation. I couldn't be more excited today to have my guest on today. You know, there, there's, there's a theory in life of having six degrees of separation uh, that we all have with one another. Well, with this young man, I, I think it's 0.6 degrees of, of separation, as you'll hear, you'll hear about here shortly. I, I had the pleasure and the privilege uh, to int introduce Tony Cord of Newport uh, Investors, Advisors, uh, here with us today. Tony, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Troy. So, Tony, let's uh, let's get started with a little bit of fun. Um, let's put a little bit of fun. I'm going to just say a couple of words and phrases. And you, first thing that comes to mind, I want you to say it, okay? You got it. You got it. Keywords. So, fun. I got that. There you go. Exactly right. Let's start with uh, 2020. Seismic shift. The world changed. Opportunity. Those are what comes to mind for me. Gotcha. Maryland. Great opportunity to lead. Lead in terms of regionalism, leveraging the assets of the state, unique assets. And we'll circle back on what I think the unique assets are, including Absolutely. TEDCO. 2021. Unprecedented opportunity. Great time to be a business builder. Great time to rethink how you do everything, in particular, your customer or client experience. Mm, I love it. A um, little different, a vacation spot you've always wanted to visit but haven't visited yet. Yeah. So um, my wife and I say frequently we're closet Canadians. We got married in Quebec City. We enjoy uh, the East Coast in Quebec, West Coast in Vancouver, but we'd like to go to the middle part of Canada and explore the Rocky Mountains there. Ah. So there's all kinds of destinations there, some well-branded, others pretty much wilderness, but I've never been there and I aspire to go there. There you go. Well, again, I, I talked about our degrees of separation, so I'm gonna close with two of our degrees of, of separation. Damatha. Yeah, so Damatha Catholic High School. Look, I'm a product of the DMV, born in DC, have lived in Maryland, Commonwealth of Virginia, and the district, and I've traveled the country, and the brand, DeMatha, grabs attention for all the right reasons. Absolutely. Now, as a student there, what, what was infused in me is you're going to be a gentleman and a scholar, but more yep. importantly, I learned how to win and lose gracefully as a team member, and I should point out, my teammates were diverse. When we were playing ball, I promise you, everybody bleeds red. Everybody wants to win and achieve and do more for themselves, their families, and their communities. And that's the, the those are the things that bind us. So the math is an important element in my life. Um, I sometimes say tongue in cheek, they got me in, 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 you know, in line because I had a little too much energy as a kid, but um, not, nothing but great great reputational uh, afterglow that I have uh, the benefit of. So we do have that common thread, Troy. Well, yeah, so for those who don't know, my son attends the math. He's a junior rising now, right? He literally just finished two days, so he's a rising senior now. And so uh, everything you said, I, I, like you said, we were traveling somewhere, I think it was in Mexico, we're getting on a plane and he had a DeMatha uh, uh, shirt on and someone stopped us and talked about DeMatha you know, we're, we're in another country and people want to know about, you know, had heard about the math and knew about the math. So you're right, has an, an amazing uh, brand and recognition. And what I've seen in his development is everything you talked about that I'd love to see. So uh, I'm going to close the, with uh, a dear friend who I saw last night, Bernard Wright. Mr. Bernard Wright. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So what, what a storied career he has been blazing positive impact all over the place. I know him through the perspective of his leadership in Prince George's County, mm -hmm. his executive role at WSSC, and in a couple of tech companies that um, uh, he, he's been in and influenced, but a class act, and he is an athlete. Yep. He's also a great mentor and a great river guide, if you will, for young people. So again, he, he's, he's the real deal. 
he is, and he, uh, again, just saw him last night, and uh, his daughter's going to College Park to, uh, to run, to look like she may run track there. So yes, so he's great. So Tony, you, you already talked a little bit about your journey. Uh, let's, let's dig into it just a little bit if we can. Uh, your journey and kind of, um, and, and like, a, like a, to some other guests, it's still not so much answering a question, talking to me, but someone that might be at the math right now that, you know, kind of a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a point in their career, their life where they're, they're trying to think, or the math alum, they're trying to think through some choices and how you had to navigate some choices in your life and, and also introduce us to Newport, because uh, many people may not know about Newport and kind of what you guys do. Help me out. Troy, what what what's the question in, in that? Unpack that a little bit. What do you yeah, want me to Yeah, that's a great way. You know, no, I, I guess I, let's, let's just start with the first part of it, which is just talk a little bit about your journey to Newport, right? And and how you got there, and, and more importantly, just how you were able to overcome some challenges that you faced along the way. Got it. Got it. Well, um, the blessing for me is I, I I got an education. So for anyone who's in school, or if you're not in school. I would encourage um, to be a lifelong learner. And education comes in a lot of different flavors these days, yep. um, online, on ground, vocational or, or, or experiential. And the best lectures, the best mentors are available pretty much for free online. So, you know, we're here um, uh, with, with, with the framework of TEDCO and my goodness, technology makes education incredibly available to everyone Absolutely. on all of our devices. So I encourage lifelong learning. So the difference for me was I got an education. Uh, I grew up with two parents, neither of whom went, went to college and they talked about college, but they didn't know what the heck they were talking about. And um, at, at the math, I did get a dose of you, you know, you are preparing for your college education, your collegiate career. So education is a big deal. But once you get your first job, it doesn't stop there. In fact, it starts there because in my case, I had the good fortune of working at the local electric utility, Pepco. So a Fortune 500 company. And I noticed immediately that the, the up and coming future CEO treated everyone with dignity and respect from the security guard at the front desk to middle managers, to his fellow C-suite uh, mates. And that, that, that really struck me that he literally stopped and said hello to people and asked them how they were doing, which a lot of us do, but he listened. He listened, how are you doing, Troy? So if I was talking to a young person, I would say education. And then when you get into your, your career, watch other leaders there's going to be good bad and ugly and you draw your own conclusion about what the good is but <laughs> best practices are out there and part of it to me my journey has been about building relationships doing what i say i'm going to do and getting a return on on uh, those traits so at a big company i noticed that they paid for additional education. They offered all kinds of internal certification programs. And I just loaded up on that and was able to move um, up the chain pretty quickly. Now, I'm not an engineer. My background is finance. So I knew that my career arc at Potomac Electric Power Company as a non-engineer was going to be somewhat limited. And after seven years, I left to pursue entrepreneurship. And that entrepreneurship was risky for me because at the time I was raising four children. Oh, wow. I was yeah. the sole income earner. And what I learned was you need to take measured risks. Um, I took a big risk and it worked for a while, but then it didn't work. So one of the, the big learnings for me was, hey, I'm not so big that I can't be um, <laughs> um, dealt a dose of reality. In other words, failure. And in that failure, I had to figure out what, what do I do next? But that failure yielded me an opportunity to work for one of the best brands in the world, one called American Express Corporation. And I, I, got, a, I got a feeling for what it meant to have a great brand that to, to be associated with. The math was, was, was certainly there. 
Yep. And DeMatha got me into my undergrad and graduate schools ultimately. But American Express as a, a business, it, it blew my mind. And, and the story for me was one Saturday, American Express tries to be a good community member. And we went to, to a service day and I had my daughter who was probably eight, nine years old, maybe 10 years old at the time with me. So we're jointly serving. And the organization that we were serving had a woman that asked, sir, which, which company are you from? Because there were people from all kinds of companies. And I said, American Express. And she said, whoa, American Express. And I looked over at my daughter, her eyes were like this, like, wow, American Express, dad, that's something big. And to me, it just, it just represented to me that there is importance in branding. And when I worked at American Express Corp, I saw firsthand, they nurture their brand very carefully. Yes, they do. Very carefully. So I had a great experience there working in M&A. And while doing in, working in M&A, it's transaction work. But the way that I was effective as a deal member uh, of, of a team and a deal leader was I focused on relationships because we were buying companies. We were buying Troy's company that was his baby and he wasn't gonna give it up to someone that didn't show a lot of love and respect for the team that Troy had built. I got that. And so that was another measure uh, of my career. So American Express working for them for a period of time opened up even more doors for me. And I got the bug to help other people because I saw while doing acquisitions at American Express, getting under the hood of enough, enough companies, man, the, 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 same, the, the same fundamentals drive success and yep. profitability in virtually all industries. Yep. So no exceptions, life sciences to not-for-profits. There are, there are fundamentals that have to be addressed. And I, I had the opportunity to, to uh, learn how to be a good advisor um, in, in my deal experience at American Express. And the secret for me was be a great listener. It's not about me. It's about the people that you're talking to. And that's a fundamental in business that so many of us forget about. It's about your target community or clientele or, or customer base. What's important to them? And if you can get that right, you can go far. So Troy, I should mention resiliency because um, stuff happens. No, no, no matter how fly, high flying we all are, stuff happens. Yep. And to me, at the end of the day, uh, it's important to treat everyone with dignity and respect. Look out on the horizon for opportunities. Be an opportunist, because at the end of the day, we live in an ecosystem that is just incredibly opportunistic. If you keep your eyes open and you think about, you know, where 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 can I capitalize on this? How can I help others? do this or do something well I, you know what i love about your story i, I could we could just spend just telling your story but what i hear, love about your story tony is and i love about people that are successful as you've been there's always a theme but one of the key themes i really hear is and, and to get to our audience who may be listening is that this thing isn't linear this notion of success isn't linear that it's not some straight path to success and i think too many times people will look at tony today and assume that that's all you were always there, right? You're always the Tony of today, and they don't see the ups and the downs and the risks that you took, and and the and the, and you know the, the challenge you had to put your family through, and the learning and the relationships, and that this is real work to get to this point, and and the dedication to it is something that I'm hoping people heard about from your story that that I love to hear. Yeah, I I, I want to underscore that. Uh, our career path and our lives are, are not linear. It, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, and it, it sounds cliche, but you got to be prepared for the long haul and know that there are going to be challenges along the way. And that's what makes it so sweet. Well, we're here today. Obviously, we got the tech, we got the, 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 the Bernard and the Matha connection, but we're here because uh, 
your firm and you, I want you to talk about Newport. Uh, we really want to get into this notion of innovation. You mentioned it when you talked about 2021 and the opportunities in 2021. So why don't you introduce us first to Newport and, and, and what you guys do at Newport? Newport is a national boutique advisory firm. We focus on lower middle market companies and the challenges are typically growth, lack thereof, and preparation for uh, a transaction. So those three areas, my team is comprised of senior operating executives. My partners are women and men who are former C-suite executives, successful entrepreneurs and professional services folks. We all have the service chip. We wanna help others. And we drop into companies as CEO advisors. Mm -hmm. We frequently roll up our sleeves and serve as interim C-suite executives, operating executives. So we come in to augment or fill a gap on a, a fractional or, or temporary basis. So think interim CEO, interim CIO, interim chief marketing officer, chief HR officer, chief technology officer. Um, and and those, those roles uh, vary in terms of duration and in terms of intensity. Sometimes they're a half day uh, every week. Sometimes they're four days a week. Sometimes they're eight days a week, depending on the intensity and where the business is and their, their cycle. But the common threads are we're helping address lack of growth, managing hyper growth, or getting ready for uh, a, a valuation and a, a transaction. Uh, so optimizing the value of the company is what Newport does. We are um, interesting because the backgrounds are women and men coming out of the Fortune 50, coming out of the big five consulting firms. So think Accenture, Capgemini, Deloitte, et cetera. Um, we, have, we have that experience but we've also all been entrepreneurs and that makes us relevant. Yep. We, we um, understand the bigger picture and large company scaling, what it means to work at that level. But we also understand going from startup through emerging growth, emerging growth into lower middle market and scaling through the middle market. That's what, that's what makes us unique. And what about technologies, the technology sectors that you play in? Yeah, so um, we, we, we have technology as a common thread amongst all of our clients, but um, uh, innovative technology is what I personally look for. I like identifying the innovators and nurturing them and understanding what are they trying to grow. And the value that I can provide is an understanding of what a bigger player, like a private equity group, like a strategic investor or a financial investor might be looking for as they grow their, their business. So it could be that they're building to create a long-term business or to get ready for a transaction. But by, by my focus and my partner's focus on the innovators, understanding where, where the innovation is coming from and what it looks like, and then matching them up with bigger players, there's real value in that. And that's a lot of fun. I'm sure it sounds like a lot of fun. And obviously, you know, the role of Tetco, we play some of that role. We're helping you at the earlier stages with that. So we appreciate the support that you've given our, the ecosystem in Maryland. How has COVID affected that, Tony? How has COVID affected kind of what you guys have been doing? And, 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 and I hate to ask the compound question, but I think, it's, a, I think it's, it's to what I know what you want to talk about is how, is how has it created what's next? How has it created the opportunity for what's next? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question and one that I'll, I'll start by, by trying to provide some data and then some insights. Um, we just surveyed roughly 100 lower middle market CEOs across the United States to learn what their experience was during COVID and what their plans are coming out of COVID and the impact that they said 80% of the respondents indicated that they had a chance for better performance because they were implementing so many changes. Yeah. So if, if I boil that down, COVID caused all of us to rethink our internal processes. Absolutely. And then from an M&A perspective, mergers and acquisitions, 
57% of the companies surveyed that had M&A plans delayed them. 13% accelerated them. So my takeaway on that is there is some pent up demand pent up demands. Yep. For, for transactions. Now, many of these companies, as all these companies have technology as a common thread, although they might be in business services or in manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, but uh, that common thread that they got delayed in 2020 is something to, to think about for all of us as we think about 2021 and going forward. Growth. 33% of the respondents showed revenue growth with technology and smaller companies outperforming the larger uh, companies. And then last but not least, in terms of profitability, the data we got from the survey was that 55% had EBITDA, earnings before interest tax, depreciation, yep. amortization, declines. They experienced negative operational and supply chain impacts. So their profitability was down. 55% of them had their profitability down and they were experiencing operational and supply chain challenges. So the fact that we've got that very recent market intel and that data that I just shared makes me believe that there's pent up demand for transactions that everyone who reinvented internally looking at their processes is poised to go to market in a different way. I literally believe that we're on the cusp of another roaring 20s. Yeah. I think so, good times are ahead, Troy. No, so one of the uh, things I talk about, Tony, is, you know, we, we compare, I'd like to compare this and see if you agree, compare this uh, to right after 9-11, you know, right after 9-11, we had to have a whole new terminology and a new technology to, so that we would feel more safer going into airports, going into, going on airplanes. But here, here's the point is that, you know, in order to reinforce that behavior, we all had to travel with a little three ounce bottles, right, in order to go through security. So, so the, the thing I like to talk about, Tony, is what's the three ounce bottle analogy that's coming out of COVID? In other words, what's going to be that new invention? What's going to be that innovation that's going to help be, to support the new behaviors that we all are going to have coming out of COVID uh, and to take, to take advantage of some of this pent up demand that you talked about, B, and then C, these, some of these supply chain logistics are real, are really real. Right. And, and someone's going to one, you're not just going to fix them overnight. Some of these things are going to take some takes years. And so someone's going to invent some ways to help circumvent some of those. So the whole point is how innovation, the three ounce bottle that supported our behaviors coming out of 9-11. There's something or some things that are come out of, coming out of this that's going to support new behaviors or capture that new capture that new demand. Well, I wish I had the best crystal ball. I have a crystal ball, but. Do I have the best one? I wish. But I think, I, I, I guess when I, I think that there's been a fundamental shift where a wider segment embraces technology. Yep. And, and I'll give a, a quick example. And everyone can relate. We're on enough video platform calls now to remember that Last February, a lot of those calls were clunky because not a le not everyone had um, experience getting onto the platforms. Now it's ho oh, hum, everyone does it. That technology existed, but we are now embracing and using technology, and it's at every level. You know, nearly every man, woman, and kid who wants one has a smartphone and, and can navigate the world that way. So embracing technology. Um, that already existed is one of the, the seismic shifts in my mind. So leveraging that technology to be more customer centric and to focus on the customer or user experience, I think is one, one of the, the 3D model things coming out of COVID-19. And I know you've, you've used the word several times, uh, the service, this, your, I know your orientation is service and I know- That's you right. Know, it's so, and so I guess I want to marry this conversation that service with this technology. Look, the, I think what 2020 and COVID exposed that, that uh, it exposed that there was all these inequities that existed uh, in, in our society. And 
technology, to your point, this technology acceleration that has happened has even leave, has created even a wider gap. Uh, you, you can't order, you know, you can't be a part of this cashless economy if you don't have some type of banking instrument, if you don't have a credit card or have a bank account. And so your ability to participate in this cash economy is, is coming. You can't participate in telehealth if you don't have access to the internet so that you can get access to this. So there's all these great technologies that are out there, but there's clearly a divide that's happening. And, and, and I'll, I guess my question is, as you as you think about from yourself, and I know how you think about, you've talked to me about these and, and this new portal, like, how are you guys thinking about this whole diversity, equity, inclusion as you, as you at the same time, you know, at the end of the day, you're investors, you have, you have a, a, a responsibility to your investors, but I yeah. know you have responsibility to society that you've talked about. Yeah. So I think that we as leaders have to have tough conversations amongst ourselves as peers. And we, we have to do more and we have to do better. I'm in a unique position as a majority male. When I'm in the C-suite or boardroom, I can credibly slap the table and say, what the heck are we doing about equity and inclusion? Mm -hmm. and, and demand that it be uh, addressed. It, it has to be intentional, Troy. So leaders like yourself, like myself, like my partners, like the clients we serve have to get focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and at all levels, okay? At, at the senior levels, at the middle management levels, at the staff levels, inclusion has to be addressed. Equity has to be addressed. And it, 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 it takes intentionality. So I believe that technology has accelerated the demands for addressing inequality, inequities, and for leaders, um, one of the biggest challenges now is to have an effective workforce that is armed with technology. So again, it, it, it's, it's not an easy subject to broach. Uh, I'm really happy that we're talking openly about it, but it takes tough conversations. And it takes an examination beyond words. Okay, what does your organization look like? And if I turn the lens on my own organization, you know, we're having conversations, but are we doing enough? We're trying, but why? Why aren't we as diverse as we need to be? So I think that it, it takes conversations like this, Troy, and the technology that's out there. The embracement of technology during COVID nineteen has set the stage now for addressing the diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Well, another again, common friend of ours, Marty Rosendale, who, you know, is one of your, one of your partners as well. You know, he's trying to have that conversation. He's, he's asking the conversation with people like myself and Bernard around what's the role that technology should play in helping that conversation. But you're 100% you're, you're right, Tony. It, it has to start with the conversation. And as you just said, it has to start with a, a white middle, a white guy saying, hey, this is something we have to address. And so I appreciate your honesty and your conviction to it, uh, and your intentionality to it. So thank you. And, I, and I'm looking forward to the future conversations on, on the subject. That's well, what it's going know, to take. Look, as I said earlier, my DeMatha experience, I learned from my teammates, my DeMatha community was pretty diverse. We all bleed red. We all want to win. We all want to have the dignity of work and doing great things for ourselves and our family. And so if, if we think about these things and are intentional, we'll remember that everyone, everyone wants to be part of this potential rising tide in America. And I said, we're going to have a roaring 20s. I hope like heck that it's not one-sided that it's just the majority group that, that thrives in the roaring 20s, when I think it could be much broader for the very first time. Well, I think it, and it has to be, right? It has to, it, if it's gonna be the roaring 20s, it's, it's gotta be more inclusive. It's gotta include more, more folks and what can happen. And I guess another, another lens on that is that, you know, you and I sit in this thing that, uh, for those that don't live in the area called the DMV, uh, the District of Maryland and Virginia, and, and, right. and the fact that they, they exist in this interesting, you know, ecosystem, if you will, Clearly, I'm focused on Maryland, but I can't ignore what happens in D.C. Uh, and Virginia. And I know you you have some investments as well. Talk to, talk to our, our listeners about how this DMV really can and should be a leader in this in, a, in this innovation economy, and how we how we need to work better together in this kind of notion of regionalism uh, going forward. Sure. 
Well, the District Maryland and Virginia have rich and unique assets. Not that other parts of, of our country don't, because they do. But in particular, we have the nation's capital here. So all of the policy making is here. In the state of Maryland, we have rich innovation and academic type assets. So the FDA, the NIH, Johns Hopkins University, and I could go on and on and on. We also have rich natural resources, not that other parts of the country do not, but we have a very interesting corridor, I'll say from Baltimore to Richmond, Virginia, that can be seen as a common marketplace. And it, it's, it's perfectly positioned for regionalism. Maryland, in my opinion, is perfectly positioned to be a leader in that regional conversation, a leader on big topics like infrastructure, like diversity and inclusion, like education. It, 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 it uh, is totally opportunistic. And by the way, it is the fourth largest economic marketplace in, in the United States. So lots of, lots of uh, great reasons to have that regionalism. But in Maryland, a good deal of, of energy is devoted to life sciences and technology companies. And most of them are working to improve and save lives. That's worthy of regional, if not national and global conversation. So I just think we're, we're in a position where we have the nation's capital, we have two thriving states contiguous, and we have the right leadership in place now to talk about technology, life sciences, and tech as the catalyst for creating something great, not only regionally, but nationally. That's going to be fun. So what, what do you think, and I know it's, there's, there's always politics in these things, but what do you think is going to be helping to knit those things together uh, in, a, in, a, in a more effective ecosystem? I, I think the new administration is going to be a huge driver um, with, with, with a focus on infrastructure. Yep. Uh, I think a focus on um, education. So I think the, the infrastructure um, investment that the new administration is um, focused on will be a great catalyst for regionalism because it's going to involve our transportation infrastructure, the education system in particular. I think those will be two key drivers. But I think an, another thing to, to keep in mind is there are a number of innovative young people that are in positions of more and more influence and power. And that next generation, the folks who come through TEDCO that are the innovators, they're tomorrow's leaders. There's tons of them in the DMV. Again, not to the exclusion of other parts of the country, but in my experience, the nation's capital has always been a magnet for people who wanna come and serve and create new technologies, new policies, that hasn't gone away. So again, that's that's a unique attribute uh, of, of our region. And I think TEDCO's in a, a, a terrific position and the state of Maryland's in a terrific position to lead the charge uh, on regionalism. No, you know, I, I think you've heard me say, I think uh, one of TEDCO's responsibilities is to knit together, is to be the great knitter, to help either lead the knitting or help others lead in that knitting of all these great elements that exist in, in Maryland and in the DMV. And, uh, I, I think I know you're right that if you look at this, all these statistics of, of, the, of the number of federal labs, the number of PhDs, the number of the percentage of the population that has a, has a bachelor's or master's degree, we lead in all those different areas. And we, we do have the DMV, we lead even, even more so. And so it's just about how do we have that sense of a sense of place and a sense of clarity. And it's okay to compete but it also makes sense to cooperate too. So we have to find a way to both compete and cooperate to make this make the region what it could be. Yeah, I think we have to. And I think that, again, there are, there are key leadership roles yourself, your, yours included, that are, are in place now that are having these conversations that will facilitate ha having the, the regional approach. Um, I think, you know, we, we can look at um, governors, CEOs of for-profit companies, other public sector leaders, NGO leaders. We have so many of them here and they are being challenged by the next wave of leaders 
the the um, the Gen Xers, the Gen Yers, the Millennials who are coming that that are uh, pushing for more cooperation. Completely. Well, look, man, we could keep on talking. I, I, Tony, I just so enjoy every time we've had a chance to to, to chat, and I'm looking forward to Me too. To, to to chatting. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you personally and professionally, and and uh, um, uh, again, thank you for being on on our show today. Well, thank you, and thank thank the TEDCO uh, team. What what the TEDCO organization is doing for life sciences and tech companies in the state of Maryland if not the region is incredibly important. And so I salute your leadership and your team's uh, work. Thank, thank you. Thank you on behalf of the team, thank you. So to our listeners, we can't thank you enough uh, for your continued uh, support. We continue to get great feedback and, and great listeners uh, for, for the show. So we appreciate that. Appreciate guests like Tony being, being able to be a part of it. So again, my name is Troy Lamel Stovall, the CEO and Executive Director for TechCo. Uh, thanks again for this TechCo Talks. We'll see you next week.